So once again, welcome to session two. These are some slides that we didn't cover in session one uh, that are also in the PDF. Uh, this slide talks about what makes up a team. And this slide has the six core values that are common to all of the FIRST programs, including FIRST LEGO League Challenge. So what do the kids do? Uh, they do an, a miniature engineering project. It stress, stresses creativity and fun and teamwork. Um, there are uh, requirements and alternatives and rapid prototyping and testing all the different things that engineers do. Um, the younger kids may uh, do a lot of things by total trial and error, but uh, you're gonna wanna gradually tell them to be systematic about brainstorming possible ways of solving a problem, uh, considering how sensors uh, might be used, how an, an additional mechanism might be added to the robot. Um, if the team's large enough, you, uh, you might have uh, two different subgroups wor working on the same problem and then comparing their solutions and potentially combining their solutions. <coughs> and then testing will often lead to uh, discovering that the initial solution isn't reliable or um, doesn't really solve the problem, and then they can go back and make some changes. These are all things that real engineers do. Uh, definitely hands-on. It's uh, hands-on in terms of building and programming the robot, and the project is, is very much hands-on, as we'll get into. Um, the annual theme is uh, ties it to a real-world context. Um, this year, it's transportation and logistics. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. I'm not an expert on this year's theme. Um, I get confused. I've been doing this so long. I, I'm, you might catch me suddenly talking about the, uh, the Mars mission from uh, 15 years ago. Um, the uh, kids can divide up and some can be designers, builders, others can be programmers, others can be the ones developing their presentation for their project. But whenever possible, rotate those roles because we want the kids to have a variety of experiences and build a variety of skills. And as you think about your own career and the careers of people you know, you'll see analogies to what the kids are doing. Uh, they're often developing skills that are uh, just as much career related as uh, the core classes that they're taking in school. And we talked about last time, it's really important that the kids do the work um, because that's the way they learn and, and that makes it fair for all the teams. Questions on this slide? So if things get better rapidly, uh, this season will look more and more like a normal season with uh, the teams meeting uh, in person and uh, then coming to an in-person event on one of the first weekends in December. Uh, we'll have qualifying tournaments around the state if uh, things are going reasonably well. Uh, I would expect the kids will still be required to wear masks and there may be other distancing rules, uh, but hopefully it'll be in person with in-person judges and in-person referees. Um, there may be restrictions on how big a particular event is or how many kids can be around the table at one time. We'll, we'll go by what uh, public health guidance is as we approach December. Um, the, um, there's also a chance that things will get worse uh, and uh, or, or stay as bad as uh, some of us uh, are seeing it now, in which case we might need some of this to be remote. We were pretty successful last year at having uh, the interviews that the judges do uh, operate by Zoom. And uh, the kids uh, ran their robot from their ho home or school location and uploaded videos that were then reviewed by referees uh, and scored. So uh, there are ways of doing uh, using technology to uh, make up for the pandemic. But again, we're hoping that we can be pretty close to normal by December. 
Uh, feel free to ask questions about this, even though my crystal ball is probably not going to be a lot better than yours. So this is, would have been a slide I showed last night if we were on schedule. So we're about to cover these things in session two, part two. So let's talk about money. Uh, the Spike Prime kit, including the expansion set, is $445 with shipping. The uh, EV3 uh, set is no longer available, but you may uh, already have one available to you. So uh, it it's, shouldn't be incremental cost. Um, we recommend you build a plywood and two by four table. You saw one in Chris's quick uh, video of his room. Uh, but there are ways around that if that doesn't fit your budget or your situation. We can talk about that as you, as you like. Um, and then there are annual costs. The, the table should last many years. The, uh, the uh, set you buy, the robot set you buy for the uh, team should last many years. Uh, but there's an annual registration fee. The reason such an odd number is uh, Lego charges, or excuse me, first charges a, a shipping charge because they, they mail you some things that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, then every year there is a challenge set, which is a mat that's uh, about seven feet long. and uh, It has some extra room in the eight foot table and about four feet wide. And then bags and bags of Legos. And then you download the instructions on how to put the Legos together to create very clever mechanisms. They, uh, get placed on the mat using what, what I was talking about last night, uh, uh, a variation on Velcro called dual lock. And um, that forms the annual challenge. You'll need a new one of those each year because the annual challenge is different each year. Um, and I, I believe the, the price for that set is something like $75, but it, there's a shipping charge for that. So it's about 90 total. Um, then you get to decide how crazy the team gets um, to go out and buy a bunch of white t-shirts and felt tip pens and, uh, and hand draw your own team shirts. Do you, uh, do you go out and get uh, free hats from the local lumber store and, and, and write your team on it? Or do you splurge and, and spend money on these things? Um, it's not required or necessary that you do anything, uh, but it is fun to kind of think about how the team will identify itself when it goes to an event. And then depending on how far you are away from uh, the events, um, you're gonna have some travel expenses, maybe uh, small or large, depending on how, whether it's uh, parents driving or and what the distances are and whether it's school bus, uh, cost your team money if, if you need one. Um, then there's uh, an Oregon season fee. Uh, I don't know if it's officially been announced, but I'm pretty sure it's $200. Um, and then uh, the, if your team does well enough to go to the championship, there will probably be an extra fee for the championship, but that has not firmed up yet. So figure a brand new team is gonna cost 1,000 to $1,400. We'll talk about where that money comes from in a minute. And then usually the price goes down the second year unless you go crazy with extra stuff. <coughs> uh, you don't have to buy a new robot set. So your, your uh, budget should be lower. Questions about these costs? Um, okay, somebody put in chat that the website says 200. Which, yeah, I, I, I think I discovered that it has been firmed up. Yeah. So I should update this slide. 
attempt to do it now, but I'll try to remember to do it later. So what do you get with the registration fee, you, uh, registration fee that you pay first in New Hampshire? Um, you get a team number. Uh, if you've got a veteran team, you can request that you use the same number as before, but it becomes legal to use it once you've paid your fee. You get printed copies of the team meeting guide, the robot game rulebook, and the engineering notebooks. Uh, while you're waiting for that, uh, some of that material can be downloaded from the coach portal. Uh, you also uh, can uh, register and compete in uh, qualifying events like the ones we hold here in Oregon. And you can use the first storefront to purchase the challenge set and uh, a slightly discounted uh, Lego robot set. And we'll talk more about the sets uh, in a few minutes. And you have access to the online team roster, which you'll need to get filled in so that you have a rostered team before you attend an event. And uh, so where does the money come from? Uh, your choice. Um, you can charge dues if you like. Uh, be careful with that because you don't want to make dues an impediment to the kids participating. Uh, you can um, have fundraising activities. You're going to have to be a little extra creative, creative because some of the things that kids do for fundraising may be uh, less appropriate during COVID. Uh, I don't know. Do kids still do car washes? I guess if they wear their masks and do it outdoors. Um, is that appropriate for nine-year-olds? Probably not, but maybe for the middle school kids. I don't know. Uh, you can recruit game sponsors. Maybe some local stores would like their names on your ki uh, kids' T-shirts. Um, because they're, uh, they want to be thought of well in the community and they, they want your, uh, your family's businesses. Um, and you can apply to uh, ORTOP for team financial support. Uh, that application process has started. Um, we no longer offer that to uh, individual uh, coaching teams. You need to have some affiliation with a, a school or nonprofit in order to qualify for team financial support. Um, but if you think about that in advance, even if you hold your team meetings uh, in somebody's family room, perhaps uh, a school PTA uh, will serve as your um, official uh, nonprofit entity or, or a church group or whatever. Um, so this expands on, on uh, uh, team member dues, um, and we recommend that you have a way that um, the parents or the kids can request a discount or a waiver without embarrassing themselves, um, and expands a bit on, on the sp team sponsor idea. And then some more on fundraising. And this web, web address is current. I, I checked it this evening. So you'll, you'll find more about um, team financial support at this web address. And it is open. So let's talk about the kits. Um, if you've got me minimized, um, you may want to switch to speaker view so you can see the kits a little better. Um, maybe I shall stop the screen share. Sometimes that makes it easier to see big things or see things bigger on the screen. Um, so this is the main Spike Prime uh, tub. I held up the uh, EV3 tub last night. From the outside, they look the same, except the EV3 is black. <clears throat> so let me take the lid off. has a separator and it has a guide for what you put in the various trays. It's too small for you to read, but I'll try to hold up the trays without spilling them. This kit is pretty well sorted. And that'll be a challenge when the kids are using these, they keep the, the parts in the right places. And each little part of the tray has different parts in them. Uh, this one has four different sections. This has four more different sections. They, they fit, they float on the top of, of the tub. And then some of the bigger parts go down inside the tub. 
Uh, right now I've got the large motor in the tub. Uh, the main kit comes with one large motor and two, and two mediums, but the expansion set, which we started talking about last night, is a separate box that I have now put in the tub, and uh, it gives you some samples. But if you look at the, if you squint, you can see this is the inventory of, of all the things that you get in the expansion set. And the exciting things are you get some bigger wheels, you get another large motor, another color sensor, and a bunch of really useful Lego uh, pieces for making a more sophisticated robot. Um, the online instructions for building various robots, um, the, the robot that looks like this one uh, can be done without the expansion set. Uh, but to do the bigger robot that has uh, ways of attaching accessories on the front and back and uses uh, bigger wheels, um, uh, does require that you um, have the expansion set. And in fact, I cheated on this robot. I'm using two color sensors, one from the base set and one from the expansion set. Questions about the set uh, and the robots, et cetera? Uh, somebody mentioned uh, tackle boxes. I'm a big fan of tackle boxes. If you have time at the end, I'll show you my various uh, tackle boxes that I use for, for Lego parts. So let's see if I remember how to do the screen share. Go back to the slides. Okay, so the hub, if I hold it up, it looks like a white brick with one button. Uh, that's because there's a lot of white on white. Um, but in fact, it has labeled ports on each side, A, B, C, D, E, F. And uh, in the case of Spike Prime, they can be, uh, any of the connectors or ports can be used for either a motor or uh, a sensor, and you the uh, as I said last night, the gyro sensor is built into the hub, so it doesn't need a port. Um, Lego, for some reason, uh, makes the A through F um, white on white by embossing the the plastic brick. You can kind of see it on mine because I took a graphite pencil. And I rubbed it on it and then rubbed off the smudge. And so it, I made it visible. So that's a trick you're learning tonight. I, I may have learned it from a kid. I forget where I, I found out that pencils are your friends. And I haven't done that to the F, so you can't really see the F. So I need to get my pencil and rub it right there so you can see the F. If you look real carefully, there's also two buttons on the side. Before the program begins, they can be used to select one of 20 programs that you've stored in the brick. Um, and once the program starts, you can use uh, these buttons to select options in the program. And uh, tomorrow night, we may get a chance to see a little bit of how that's done. This button up here turns blue when you're doing Bluetooth pairing. That's your pairing button for when you're using Bluetooth. Um, and then there's a little speaker for the robot to make noise on one end. And on this end, there's um, the USB connector uh, they can use to charge the robot and um, to download if you're not using Bluetooth. I accidentally pushed this button and it powered up. And now you can see there's a display here. This can be used to display numbers and letters uh, that can be quite useful in debugging a program or for entertainment value. The noises the robot makes can also be used functionally to keep track of what the program is doing. The light, the color sensors also provide light. And so they look like little flashlights, but they're more than flashlights. They actually uh, measure the intensity and the color that's like that's coming back. Questions about that? So this is a picture of the, the motors. There's the large motor, um, two medium motors. Uh, this is a distance sensor. That uses infrared. This is the color sensor that I just showed you. Um, 
And which one is that one? That is the force sensor. You can use it for as an on off switch, um, but it also actually measures newtons of force and that can be useful in certain circumstances. You can see each of these sensors has a cable pre-connected to it that's used to connect it to the hub when you're using it. And you can program these robots, this Mike Prime robots on a variety of platforms. I've got another slide later that talks about which operating system. Um, I can't Windows 10 here, but um, the older Mac operating systems don't work with Spike Prime, but the newer ones do. Uh, Chromebook, if you're up to date on your Chromebook, it'll work. And here's some pads that will uh, typically work. Questions about that? So when you download the software from Lego Education, um, the, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is a slide specific to uh, the Chromebook. Um, the Chromebook is much more fully featured than historically. Uh, on, if you've been doing Lego uh, robotics for a while, oftentimes the Chromebook software is um, stripped down and is missing features, but almost all the features are there. Um, the, um, the cable is not used for downloading for really esoteric reasons. Um, uh, when you use Windows or Mac, you can use the cable for downloading it as a backup to Bluetooth, but uh, with uh, Chromebooks, you can only download your programs to your robot using Bluetooth. And there's some subtleties about updating the firmware that we sort of talked about last night that may be a restriction with the Chromebook. And if you have trouble updating your firmware with the Chromebook, you may need to borrow Windows or Mac computer for 15 minutes to update the firmware. So you can't buy an EV3 kit, but you may have access to one, uh, either from a school or an organization or perhaps eBay. So we'll talk just a few minutes about that. The, the display uh, is shown here on, on the slide, as well as the robot I'm holding up. Um, and there's little menus. These are uh, a fairly sophisticated uh, way of controlling what's going on in the robot with this display. The gotcha is then at a competition where there's a, a lot of light, it, uh, it's really hard to read this screen. I, it's not powered on now, but if I powered it on and held it to the camera, uh, I'd have to hold it just the right angle for you to be able to read it. Um, the, uh, while it has a lot of great information, um, some of the kids will have trouble getting what they need without a lot of practice. Uh, by comparison, the Spike Prime's display is real primitive, but easy to read. So there's an engineering trade-off for you. Uh, the sensors and motors, uh, look a bit different on the EV3. Uh, there's the uh, small motor and the uh, large motor here in the EV3. Um, and here's the sensors. Uh, generally, they're, they're similar. This is a gyro sensor, so you won't see one, like I've said over and over, it's built into the Spike Prime hub. Uh, this is simpler force sensor, pretty much just on off. It doesn't measure uh, newtons of force. Uh, that may be sufficient in, in many cases, but in other cases. Also, a lot of teams have had trouble with this gyro uh, being stable. In my experience, the Spike Prime uh, gyro is quite stable. I had one Spike Prime robot that it became instable and Lego replaced the whole hub brick because uh, it had failed. Um, so uh, normally the, uh, the gyro sensor in the Spike Prime is a quite stable, reliable instrument. It takes a little bit of learning to use it, but it's a lot easier to program than the EV3. Uh, changing the subject, there are uh, quite a bit of resources uh, available to Oregon coaches, actually any coach that finds our website, but uh, it's designed for Oregon coaches um, and it's a, it organizes a wiki. So you can go to our main site by typing in ortop.org and find a lot of useful information. But if you add slash wiki, you'll get to a, a, a wiki site. Um, and if you click on First Lego League, you'll have a whole bunch of uh, subcategories and things you can explore as support for you as a coach. And um, 
you can use a link that's on that wiki site to request additional information be added, or you can just send me an email and I'll, I'll uh, see what I can do. Uh, if we have time later, uh, I might give you a walkthrough of the wiki to show you some of the things that are there. Any questions about what the wiki is? You probably guess that it's got something to do with Wikipedia, but it's not an encyclopedia. It's it's uh, it's coach support materials, um, but it uses the same engine. Um, so you'll see some similarities to Wikipedia because uh, the nonprofit organization that runs Wikipedia made their um, engine available uh, to other organizations like Ortop to create their own wikis. Oh, wow, we're, we're moving a lot faster tonight than we did last night. Um, this is a foreshadow of what we're going to cover tomorrow night. We're going to talk about the season uh, timeline. We're going to talk about the youth protection program, the registration process, tournament structure, uh, tournament awards, and programming a robot. Uh, we'll probably spend about half the time giving a preview of programming a robot. And then if you're interested in learning more, we have a separate workshop series starting with Monday evening of next week that gets farther into programming. Uh, why don't I show you a little bit about the wiki and uh, if we still have time, uh, we can come back and maybe get a little ahead of schedule um, and cover a couple of tomorrow's topics. So let's, if I stop this share and And then I'll start a new share for you. So I'm hoping everybody can see a, a page that has the Ortop logo and says main page. Yeah, uh, Kendra, thumbs up, thank you. So if I click on this table of contents here um, and click on First Lego League Challenge, it takes me to uh, the table of contents for that, which is on the same page, but it's, it's scrolled down for us. And you'll see the same list that I put on that slide uh, a, a minute or two ago. So if you click on Overview, um, you'll uh, get five categories on overview of the program, things that we're talking about tonight, um, but perhaps in more detail. If you go back one level, click on robot game, uh, there's this, some links to things about game strategy, tutorials uh, about the sets that we're, we're talking about. Go back a level and click on robot designing and building. Um, there's some things about spike prime building and design mindstorms, and there's some links to uh, design software should the kids want to get sophisticated and actually use online software to design the robot. Uh, Laura asked whether it's still uh, whether I said it's okay to use EV3. Yes, um, the um, I'm pretty sure you can still use the NXT from years ago and maybe even the original uh, uh, RCX from back in 2001. I don't recall any rules about not uh, no longer being able to use any robot set coming from Lego. You can't go out and use some other technology. Um, if you choose one of these generations, you can augment them with other Lego parts. Um, the kids can't go out and buy a 3D printer and make their own Lego parts. They have to use Lego parts. Uh, on, uh, and there may, uh, one year there was a restriction. They couldn't use Lego pneumatics, but you'll have to look up in the rules as to whether that's still a restriction. Um, so the, I expect to see a lot of teams using EV3 again this year because uh, those are valuable kits that they bought in previous years or um, a sister team uh, bought and gave to them um, 
sometimes the kids age out and pass the kits on to uh, the next uh, sub-generation of kids. So let me go up a level. There's one on mission strategy uh, that has uh, some links to YouTube videos. There's one that talks about sensors, spike prime sensors and Mindstorm sensors. We talked about them briefly, but if you wanna know more about any of these sensors, you can click on those links. The programming page is particularly busy with lots of content uh, for historic reasons. It starts with the, the Mindstorm uh, programming, which again is still quite legal um, and mentions the Mindstorm uh, EB3 Python. I, I don't have experience with that. That's why I always forget that it's legal and, and exists. Um, and the Spike Prime software is, is covered in the second section three. And then if you click on any of these, it takes you to a subsection <clears throat> and with uh, links to a variety of resources, including uh, videos for the kids. You may find it useful to have the kids watch these videos one or more times so that uh, they kind of become the, the experts. You don't have to know everything because they can use these video resources to learn how the sensors work and, and what, what the various programming features are good for. And we'll go to all these pages, but there's a page on the innovation project, which we're talking about more soon. And we'll talk about core values a little bit more. We touched on those before, coaching techniques, the engineering notebook, the events, the award categories, which we'll definitely talk about tonight, but there's more detail here, how to get uh, support, the specifics of the current season, and some information we added last year uh, it's still probably useful relative to the, the pandemic. So that's uh, a key resource along with the, the main or top website. Any questions about the wiki? Okay, so let me go back to the slides and we'll get a little bit ahead tonight. Part three. So the general uh, season timeline uh, we're, we're into the kind of the preseason uh, up until August when uh, the announcement of the challenge is made. Um, and, uh, the, but some teams haven't formed yet and they'll, they'll get formed uh, in the next uh, few weeks and get registered before or after they get formed. Um, uh, the national registration is open. There's the web link. Um, the uh, team financial support is open. Uh, we're, we're doing workshops like this. Um, the uh, challenge sets for the this season, uh, Cargo Connect. Oop, there's a typo there, missing a G in cargo. Um, was released on, uh, was it August 17th? I think that's right. Um, and then you have uh, three to four months, depending on which qualifying tournament you go to and when you get started uh, to, to get a lot of work done. But remember what I said last night, a new team should not expect to do it all. They'll be lucky to get some of the missions worked out and a basic project done. And, and if they don't have the project done, they should still come to the tournament. If they got a piece of a project done, but don't have the missions working pretty well, they should still come to the tournament. It's great fun, great, great learning experience. Oh, I shouldn't go forward until I ask questions about the timeline. Uh, this uh, slide says probably uh, in December, January. Uh, the schedule that I shared with you by email says December. So I expect that to hold, but um, um, if there's a disaster uh, in the pandemic world that delays it, uh, that might, I suppose, get delayed. 
but the current plan is is to do all the qualifying tournaments in December and have the championship tournament in January. See, I don't see any questions in chat. Um, so I'll keep going. So five or so years ago, uh, first added what's called a youth protection program, something that uh, other national nonprofits probably have had longer. And it requires that uh, the uh, volunteers at the events, uh, the judges and referees go through background checks and that uh, the two main coaches for a team go through background checks. Um, they do not charge extra for this. I think there might be a link uh, as you go through it to, uh, to optionally uh, make a donation to cover the, the cost because it does cost them something to get this background check done by a third party. Um, and um, it takes uh, hours or, or a few days for uh, that to come back with a green light. Um, I've never heard of anybody failing it, but I'm sure there must be somebody in this crazy world that has failed the background check um, and uh, better safe than sorry and for the kids sake. Any questions about that? Uh, as part of the youth protection program, uh, there needs to be two adults responsible for the team uh, and they both need to be background checked. Um, if there are additional adults that help out, uh, it's okay to get them background checked, but uh, the only requirement is at least two. Uh, and those should be the main ones that are uh, interfacing with the kids and organizing the meetings. Um, and uh, to get that to become official team, you also have to pay the registration fee that we talked about and then once you're registered, you can order the, uh, the kits from the portal. So this is kind of an historical slide. Uh, when, before COVID, we uh, had hundreds and teams all over the state and lots of qualifying tournaments. We're gonna have a bunch this year, but there won't be 20. Um, you can look at that schedule I sent, uh, even with the addition of the one in Ontario, there won't be 20 this year. Uh, we hope to grow back to 400 to 500 teams uh, in future years, but uh, there'll be fewer this year. Um, and uh, back in 2019, we had about 120 teams, 60 on a Saturday and 60 on a Sunday uh, for the, um, the championship tournament. Uh, the championship will probably be smaller this January. So in this past season, we actually delayed the qualifying tournaments until April in hopes of being able to hold them live and in person. But as you know, things didn't get better in April. Uh, they got better in July. So uh, it was, they were all remote tournaments here in Oregon. Uh, and likewise for the championship tournament held in late April. At the tournaments, whether they be remote or in person, the kids get three chances at the table, two and a half minutes each. They, they can, if they want, uh, attempt different missions each time. Uh, but what counts is their highest scoring round. So they're going to want to choose a set of missions that they think are relatively reliable, that can uh, score them some decent number of points, and run those missions at least once to get those points. Um, if they're satisfied with their first score for the day, they can experiment if they want, but most teams will try to go for more points in their second or third round, but you don't get to add those rounds together at the end of the day. It's at the highest round is the one that counts for the robot performer subcategory. Then they're interviewed by a panel of judges about their robot design and programming about their innovation project, which we'll still need to talk about, and about their understanding of core values. Um, the innovation project uh, is based on uh, the th annual theme. This year will be about uh, logistics and, and transportation. They'll be asked to identify a problem um, and uh, learn something about existing solutions to that problem and then uh, recommend an improvement or perhaps a brand new solution and create a presentation that describes their innovation. 
It uh, involves research and it involves some presentation skills. A new team will do something pretty basic uh, in terms of the research and the innovation and the presentation, but uh, as the kids get more experience, they, they can do some pretty in, uh, impressive stuff. And there's been a, a small number of teams internationally that have actually received patents for what they've done in their innovation project. Questions about this slide? Uh, this is Sunil, quick question. So Please. one of the missions says that we should use the innovation model in the robot challenge. Is, it, is that related to this or uh, do, do the kids build a model showing their innovation, innovation project using the Lego? Oh, um, in first Lego League Explore, they're required to use Legos to show their innovation. Uh, but in first uh, Lego League Challenge, uh, the project does not require the use of Legos. I've seen a few teams that, that find, find fun ways to use Legos uh, in their innovation, but uh, I've seen others uh, demonstrate their uh, innovation using cardboard or uh, a variety of other uh, uh, things that they put together or simply uh, demonstrated it by waving of hands and poster board. Um, so uh, unless the rule, unless you find a new rule in this year's uh, uh, rule book, um, Legos are not required for the innovation project, it's for the, the robot that, that is on the table. Okay. Uh, it can be confusing because First Lego League is the preface for now three programs, First Lego League Discover, First Lego League uh, Explore, and First Lego League Challenge. But tonight we're just talking about challenge. Um, so the actual number of awards at a tournament will uh, vary according to the size of the tournament, but every uh, qualifying tournament will have a, a, at least one champions award, and the team that wins that will definitely get an invitation to the state championship. Uh, they'll usually be category awards um, that um, uh, would involve uh, core values, uh, robot design, and the project. So there might uh, would typically be one of each of those and maybe in a really big qualifier, there might be a first and second in each of those categories. Uh, there would be a, a robot performance based on uh, how high a score uh, teams got on the table rounds. Um, and then there's uh, a roll up. The teams that get invited to, to the uh, championship are the ones that do well overall. So, um, and, in a small tournament, uh, doing fairly well in, in all four categories may get you an invitation, while a larger tournament might be more competitive, but there'll be more invitations issued, so it might work out about the same. Is that confusing enough? Questions about uh, the award categories? The championship, uh, we traditionally also give out an award for for a young team that did particularly well and a rookie team that did particularly well. Um, we typically don't give those awards out at the smaller qualifying tournaments. Oh, uh, somebody asked is it a, a theme each year. Yeah, uh, last year it was sports. Um, the two years ago it was uh, using technology in cities and this year it's transportation and logistics. You know, back a bunch of years, it was Mars, it was energy, it was the environment, uh, lots of different uh, real world themes. And um, uh, in January, they'll start giving hints as to what the theme will be for a year from now. So tomorrow we'll talk about uh, programming Spike Prime. And instead of showing this slide, I will show you the live screen and we'll move blocks around on the screen. We won't create anything particularly sophisticated, but we'll give you an idea that in some sense, building a program uh, in word blocks in Spike Prime is like putting Lego bricks together. Um, you can use some basic bricks and do a, a basic program. A more advanced program might use a wider variety of, of these colored bricks and uh, you see the blue and the magenta ones here, but there's also orange and yellow and 
uh, in cyan, et cetera. You can see the little dots in the left, the various colored bricks that you can scroll through and choose and drag onto the screen. Um, um, it's a little bit like any computer software in that there are more choices than you'll typically use. So I'll be giving you some guidance tomorrow on some of the more valuable blocks. And then if you take the workshop next week, I'll give you more guidance on which ones the kids will typically use early in the season and which ones they, they might end up using later um, if they have time to do more sophisticated things. Um, and it is absolutely true as it came up last night, that you don't have to use word blocks, you can use Python. Uh, if you have EV3, you'll be, you'll be using what's called EV3 Classroom. But at a glance, it looks the same because it's, it's scratch-based. The differences are primarily the difference in the sensors of the robot. Uh, so the, the little uh, blue and uh, purple and, and uh, orange blocks uh, have some difference in details based on the robot that they're building. Um, and there's a few subtle differences in the way that the words appear on the, on the blocks, but those are pretty subtle. Um, so they're both scratch-based, but both have Python as an option. Um, in a prior uh, era, I, I, I used traditional programming language professionally, and I've dabbled in Python a couple times, but I'm far from knowledgeable in Python. So uh, if you want to use Python, you need to ask me to connect you with other people <coughs> that know more than I do about it. But um, I'm becoming fairly expert on using Scratch for programming the robots. Okay, so uh, we got six minutes for questions. And as we wind down questions, we, uh, we can uh, uh, even leave early. Oh, I didn't mean to click forward. Uh, questions before we adjourn from anybody? You can put them in chat. You can shout them out. Did I skip any of the questions in chat? I only have a little window here that shows me some of them. Oh, so Laura asked about inspiring them. Um, I've never been a coach, but I've talked to a lot of coaches and it typically has to do with looking at the world around you. Um, you, you see the, uh, the Amazon trucks on the road. How, how could those become more efficient? You see there's, uh, there's UPS tr trucks and Amazon trucks and FedEx trucks uh, meandering around your neighborhood, how could that be made more efficient? Uh, what is the whole life cycle of, of getting something from uh, a mail order house on, on the East Coast that sells discount furniture uh, delivered to your front door and, and assembled? And uh, how, how might that be made more efficient? And then the kids see all these things, but they may not have thought about what's behind the door, if you will. Uh, how, how does clicking on something on a screen turn to a package on your doorstep or uh, a delivery to a business uh, where you might buy something at retail? Now, I'm, I'm just riffing here about it. I haven't given any deep thought to this year's uh, theme. Uh, seeing people saying no questions. So it's okay uh, for us to give you back three minutes of your evening. And I look forward to seeing all or most of you um, 7 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and it does look like we'll have a recording that I'll post later in, in the week for those that missed it or would like uh, a review. And so if I stop the share, well, I'll see a whole bunch of gallery views except not too many live cameras, but that's okay. I'll wait. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you tomorrow. Send me an email if you have questions. Thank you, Bruce. Bye-bye.